bodega is a guide and a storyteller, escorting you through the night, lighting the way, warding off thieves, ghosts, demons, and other oddities. Along the journey, his companions would often share with him the most curious of stories that he'd record in his codex. Perhaps you just might find yourself traveling with the Codega and sharing one of yours. So I'm going to welcome Mary. All right, Mary. So yeah, you're coming from Australia. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself um, and where our listeners can find you. Well, you just have to um, dial up my name on Google or Safari or whatever. And there are lots of information there and presentations as well. But my, um, I live in Queensland, um, which is in, obviously in the eastern states of Australia. And I've been working in this field now probably about 30 years um, wow. and have worked with about three and a half thousand individuals, families and children um, in that time. So it's global in terms of my work. I started out, um, well, I'm principal and founder of the Australian Close Encounter Resource Network, although I'm involved in a lot of other organizations and one I'll speak about a little bit today. Um, but my background primarily was as a nurse and a, a midwife. Um, and I've been a counsellor for over 35 years as well, working in grief and bereavement, a whole range of sorts of uh, family issues, all that kind of, I, you know, that was my standard. Until um, one day a gentleman came to me and told me something that changed my life and my work when he said, for this, there's no support groups for this. They just think you're crazy and told me about his extraterrestrial experiences. And that was really the beginning of this journey in the last 30 years. Wow. Wow. And, and how did you take that when he approached you and said, you know, there's no support groups for this? How, what was your first initial reaction to that? Well, he said something. He said, I've heard you're open minded. And thankfully, I am. Um, and really what was convincing was this gentleman was very mature, very articulate. He talked about marks on his body. He said that his family were having experiences. So it wasn't just him. It was his partner and the children were all having experiences. And he said, and most people just think you're a loony, just crazy. And he, you know, he wanted someone primarily to help his partner who was really struggling with this. And that was what was synchronous about that was I'd fortunately, because I'm, you know, I think I was born with a book in my hand. Um, I was, I'd already read two books very synchronously prior to him coming through the door. And I always feel there's, there's, a, there's a big plan that they get you ready for what your next job is, as it were. And I read a book um, by Dr. John Mack, Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. And Dr. John Mack was a, um, as you, you may already know, was um, a former um, psychiatric professor at Harvard University um, who wrote about this and wrote another book after that as well. Um, the, um, what he was saying was that he came in as a skeptic, but after working with a number of experiences, was very convinced that this was real. And after that, I also read a book by Whitley Strieber, who was the classic commun book Communion, and that was from his personal experience. And those two I'd just read very recently, and in walks this lovely gentleman who's still a good friend. He's an author of four books himself, um, wow. and his name's Ellis Taylor. He lives in England now. Um, and Ellis really was very, very compelling. And, and what made it even more interesting was I was doing advanced counselling at the time, took his case to uh, supervision, thinking I'm going to blow their minds. They're either going to say he's crazy or I'm crazy for presenting it or whatever. And what was fascinating about that, doing that supervision was everyone in the group, some of them were, you know, social workers, some of them were, there was a uniting minister, and all of them started to tell me about some strange experiences they had. 
So oh, it wow. almost opened the door to say, you right. know, we've had strange stuff too, which is not what I expected at all. Um, but what it proved to me is there's an awful lot that is not honored in modern psychology that actually is real to people in terms of their multidimensional experiences. So that just intrigued me even more. Yes, I'd imagine that, um, you know, sometimes people when they're having these, these, these experiences that for the most part, they just need someone to listen to. Well, it, it was very clear to me after working already in counseling and working in medical practice and counseling agencies, there's a very big difference between an experience that is otherworldly and someone who is unwell, mentally unwell. Sometimes they can be together and it will right. often be nobody's listened and they've got overwhelmed by it and that can lead to illness at the end of the day. But there's a very distinct difference between right. someone who's saying, I've had this extraordinary experience, I'm still trying to work it out. Um, and they are, are often confused too, because part of them knows it's real. Another part of them is questioning their sanity because in, in modern psychiatry and psychology, unless it's coming from your five senses, you're taught not to trust it. And, and this is, this is the pro problem with the model of psychiatry and, um, and psychology um, in today's understanding or mainstream uh, understanding when all of us know we've had experiences that can't be explained through our five senses we've all had intuition knowings feelings sensing and wondering where they've come from and it's only when you honor the fact that there's another part of you accessing those realms then you can understand more of this and i'll bring in a bit of a statistic here just to clarify um, I'm part of, I was part of uh, one of the founders of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation, which was basically doing a survey of uh, 4,200 people, 600 questions, asking them questions. And this was all conscious recall. One of the astounding statistics, which many ufologists um, struggle with, is that they, we discovered that 75% of those that had encounters were out of body not physical, only 25% really? out of 4,000 odd people globally. So this explains so much more of why they can't come back with a bit of the craft or, you know, or have something more tangible because it's their consciousness that's had the interaction. Mm -hmm. When 75% of them are out of body, what, what, would, what would that suggest to you? Well, what it suggests to me, first of all, that consciousness is primary here, that what we're looking at is something that is about consciousness and it's not just about a physical experience. And the reason that's so important is that we've discovered through our research, um, and now it's called the Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, by the way. What we've discovered is that people can have encounters after a near-death experience, an out-of-body experience, astral travel, remote viewing, right. um, through, our, you know, through shamanic experiences, through healing experiences, through channeling. The whole range can start off as being a spiritual, connecting to spirits or whatever, but ultimately with all these different intelligences. So what you're doing is you're working on another level of frequency, if you want, which enables you to access other realms, other dimensions, other intelligences, whether it's extraterrestrial, interdimensional, extra dimensional, trans dimensional, or beings from our future. Once you access that through whatever means, Kundalini awakening or some other uh, experience, you can then find not only are you seeing angelic, the angelic realms, perhaps um, elementals, you know, religious figures, but light beings, you know, and all these other beings of different forms. So it's not just ufology, that is understanding that now, it's actually covering all of them. And uh, we call that the contact modalities. All of them are relevant. That's extremely interesting. So what you're saying is, if you're opening a door, maybe like 
you're, you're practicing uh, uh, shamanism and you're opening this door. You're not opening a door of shamanism. You're opening a door of consciousness to to access yeah. so much more. You know, so it's not like oh, I'm 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 practicing Kundalini meditations. That's all I'm going. You know, that's all I'm working for. No, 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 no. It's kind of like you open this door to a gymnasium that's full of all these other um, conscious beings or conscious entities. You know, interdimensional, extra dimensional. Wow. Absolutely right. And what is important here is how you interpret that. For example, if you're very religious, you may look and see a being that looks like an angelic being. But if wow. you're not religious, you may say that's a light being. Right. It's all into interpretation. It's like it's all relative to you, you know, to your experiences yes. um, and what you are you know, maybe your consciousness needs to see, or, you know, like that's what you interpreted it as. Ah, that's amazing. It's, a, it's related to your belief system. So whatever it is that you're believing, and, and one of the biggest issues for those that have a religious belief, for example, and taught not to have anything to do with anything otherworldly, because it's demons or whatever, will come in and absolutely terrified when they get communication or downloads or whatever, thinking it's all evil, when in fact it may not be at all like that. It's just right. that their old programming or their religious beliefs is saying this is dangerous or whatever, when in fact they may be getting very beautiful information, very helpful information, or information that enhances their lives in some way. So they'll come to me with that fear. And when we explore it, often it's not what they've believed at all. It's something that's been very positive and very helpful. I'll tell you a little story. I Many years ago, I think it was in about 2006, I was in yeah. England at Oxford and it was with, I was staying actually with Ellis for a short time and he'd, he'd organised for me um, to speak at the forum in, in Oxford University. And there was a, um, a fellow of the, I, um, I've forgotten one of, one of them was the speaker, but the other one was an astrophysicist from Manchester University. And I was sort of thrown in at the deep end, um, presenting this is a reality. And you could see their faces, you know, looking at this strange English woman who comes from West, then Western Australia talking about aliens and UFOs. You know, you could imagine that what they were thinking. And I knew exactly what they were thinking. But would you believe after half an hour of each speaking, including the astrophysics, saying it basically is impossible for us to be visited and all the rest of it? I actually won the forum, believe it or not. I still don't know how I did that. But the thing that was interesting was one of the students came up to me afterwards and he said to me, I have a friend. And I thought, yeah, um, the friend took magic mushrooms and he saw a gray being. Was that genetic or was he in fact, you know, genetic memory or was that in fact real? And I said to him, it will be absolutely real. That's what you wow. were experiencing. And that was in 2006. And since then, it's been pretty obvious that what all of these different combinations do, psychedelics or whatever, ayahuasca or whatever, what they're doing is, is shifting our perceptions to a greater reality, more frequencies, more dimensions. And what that enables us to do then is access that. That's what, you know, shamanism is in the indigenous communities. Anyway, they know this. They know yeah, there's yeah. spirits and beings and whatever, all these different intelligences in different levels. And, you know, for some people, you know, when they connect to what they call their guides, it might be a, a being that looks like a mantis or it might be a being that looks like a lion or a feline of some kind. And many are seeing these different forms. So, you know, at the end of the day, what is the problem with our 3D programmed reality is it's a limiting and limited version of what actually reality is. And we are programmed to believe that's all there is in Western mm. society, which is actually just allowing your five senses any kind of credibility. When we have sensing, knowing, feeling, awareness, and uh, access to all of this, once we allow ourselves to honor it and uh, allow ourselves to acknowledge it, and then you open the door. Do you, Mary, do you think there were there will ever be an overlap with Western science and say, Eastern uh, mysticism, you, mysticism or sh uh, shamanism. Is that the word? Shamanism. Shamanism. Thank you. Uh, shaman shamanism. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> Eventually, yes. do you think there's going to be some tipping point in which the material science will catch up with the, the other part of the, the world? 
I think it's happening. And what we're doing, I'll just get this hold of this for you. This book here is one of the stop. It's called A Greater Reality, The New Paradigm of Non-Local Consciousness, The Paranormal and Contact Modalities. And this has got in it astrophysicists. They've got medical doctors. We've got a whole range of stories and articles about consciousness and how they've had experiences. So it's bringing the bringing this into a reality through many academics. Good. I've met many, yeah. many that have had experiences, lawyers, doctors, nurses, social workers, celebrities, politicians, and whatever. This isn't and just one social economic. I, Go on. Sorry to interrupt you, Mary. Um, I have a question. Are they, when, when they're coming forward and in this book, are they actually giving out their, are, are they like, giving out their names or are they remaining anonymous? I, I, that, that is something I find uh, curious because if, they, if they're if they stepping forward and stepping out, you know, that's powerful. They're all the names and some of oh, them wow. have had profound experiences. Um, I've written in it as well and I've explained my work, but also some things that I've experienced that I was able to look at from sort of two perspectives. One as, as a researcher um, yeah. working with people with experiences and also some unusual things that have happened with me that have helped me understand how they have experienced it because it's been very useful with my own experience to understand how it's happened for them. So I, I think we're all given the tools we need to work in I, whatever way that we're meant to. I think it's all set up <laughs> in a way. I, I agree. Like you said, how you were being prepared, you know, you just read these two books and then all of a sudden you had someone approach you. It was as if you were being prepared and it's like, they didn't approach you until you had read those books. And it's, it, it's very synchronistic, you know, it's like, and, and, and I totally believe in synchronicities and everything, you know, manifestation. I, I totally, everything happens for a reason. Um, yes. I do want to circle back to the question. Uh, when you said 75% of these um, encounters were out-of-body experiences, um, were some of them in dream state or were they just like, can you, can you explain that a little bit further about these out-of-body experiences? What's interesting in the questionnaire that I, I give to people who want to know whether or not this is relevant to them in some way or another, one of them is about dreams that are not really dreams. Normally when we dream, we wake up and within a few minutes, we've lost the dream. It's gone, yeah. you know, with an encounter or an experience on board craft. And they may say, I've dreamt that I've been on spacecraft or whatever. Is that real? Or is that just my imagination or what have you? And often the, the dream where they've been on a spacecraft, they've never forgotten it. Like it could have happened 25 years ago, 10 years ago, or whatever. They've never forgotten it. And I'm saying it's most likely that's not a dream because normal dreams, as I say, you forget very quickly. The fact that they will remember details of it. And I've only written recently um, a presentation on a woman who had what she thought was a dream on a spaceship with some of her friends. Um, and the next day, literally, they rang her up and said, we had this strange dream where we were on a spaceship with you. And that was wow. her friends as well as. And there was one gentleman that was actually he thought, again, he was having a dream being on uh, the smaller spaceship with this lady. And he remembers saying to her, this is amazing. I won't use the F word. This is absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> she remembers that. And the next day he he uh, contacted her and said, I dreamt I was on this little, uh, little spaceship. And then we went to the big one and it was amazing. <laughs> and he was he found himself. There was a bright light. He, he didn't. He thought it was a lorry coming. And the next thing he knows, he's three miles away from where he was walking. They dropped him off Holy. three miles. Away. Wow. So. You know, this is the kind of thing where you just say, hold on a minute. This isn't, you know, this isn't just a fantasy. This is this. And that's what I mean about dreams that are not dreams. Often it's you out of body and you're remembering the out of body experience. And some have amazing recall of these out of. But the children often, you know, they they will remember it as is. You know, I, I remember one eight year old explaining to me that he often goes up on the craft they're teaching them in a group with other children that some of them don't look human. And I remember him saying to me, and they teach you how to use your mind. And it's very complex sometimes, the information they give you. And I'll never forget his response to me 
And he, he, I said to him, so you talk about this conflict, complex information. What kind of things did they teach you? And he just looked me straight in the eye and said, it's too complex for you. <laughs> really? Wow. So, there I had it. it. I wouldn't understand. And I mean, this is an eight-year-old telling me this. Yes. What percentage of people are excited about the dreams compared to the people or dreams or experiences compared to the people who are afraid of them? It's more common than you'd believe. The trouble is with the truth embargo and the agendas going on from those that know the truth is generally they want us to be frightened. And the bottom line is that it's not like that at all. To give you an example of that, when they try and promote that, you know, the, 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 this evil agenda and what have you. First of all, I go back to the fact that we are a created, um, it, we are a part of an intelligent design. And there's lots of evidence to show that we have been created by certain intelligences. Some say at least 12 different species, some say at least 22 different species. And the gods that have come down through the ages, who do you think they are? They're not gods at all. They're ET races that have come down and interacted with us and appeared like gods because they had the technology. There's so much evidence for that now, you know, that most people can see that, that what that is. Now, if they've got an evil agenda, they had plenty of time to take us out anyway. Easy. I, I, agree. I agree. I agree totally when they're they're Absolutely. trying to create a fear of everybody to be as scared of, oh, That's we're going to we're going to be attacked. Well, that would have happened. Uh, it, it, it's not. It, it, whatever yeah. is being projected is not right. Yeah. What we've noticed when we asked for the ultimate understanding of those 4,200 individuals, we asked them how they felt about it as they'd come to go through maybe the fear to start with, this is happening, this is real, am I crazy, all that stuff, to a point where their lives have been totally changed. And 85% of them, now that's a big number, 85% noticed a psycho-spiritual transformation, which meant their whole attitude to life changed. They become more ecologically aware, they, they changed their diet. They wanted to do things for humanity. They feel connected to everyone. And a whole mm. range of other things happened after their experiences. There was only 15% that said for them it was still horrendous and they believed they were evil. And what, what people the... don't know, what people don't know of the 15%, I've been in experience of groups where there's maybe 70 individuals. And there's always been a highly traumatized group of them and generally they're the ones and i know people are going to struggle with this they that have been through the military abduction scenario that's my lab and i don't know if people know about my lab i don't know if you know about my lab but there are agencies on this planet that have the technology to abduct people and have done it taking them to underground bases and emulate the abduction experience because they want to and there's books written on it um, Helmut Lam is one of them. Dr. Helmut Lam has written about this. I have met them. I have worked with them where they're in underground bases being told, um, drugged, interrogated, raped, the whole lot. And what the military in these groups, these covert military do is they want to know what happens on the board craft, what they learn, all these kind of things. They're after information. But the person is so traumatized by that that they never talk about it. Very few will fit because who's going to believe them that there are human beings doing that to them? Who's going to believe it? So this it, it, is exactly, a, you know, this is the complexity of this and it's not black and white. And it's something that you need to, the public needs to know about. There's other agendas. What is that really crucial here is that when you get 85% saying that ET experiences have been transformative, there is, the result of that agenda. What's the result of the military agenda is terrifying people from all anything to do with ETs. And that 15%, I would say a high percentage of them have had those kinds of experiences. So it's not straightforward. This is very, very complex. And, you know, the average person has no idea that we have these kinds of the technology that, that certain groups have on this planet is very identical to what the ETs have. Do you feel that uh, Betty and Barney Hill were one of those that were abducted by the, the government, by the uh, the military? I don't like I know. know 
Okay, sorry. Um, it's hard to say because I haven't worked with them. I only know the story that they had, um, which yeah. seems to be very credible in terms of what they've interacted with. But a lot of the governments, if you notice when the sightings of a craft, often suddenly there are black helicopters. Yes. Yeah. Around. Okay. Right. Because once they come through, come through into our reality, that's when the um, then they can be monitored by our military, and that's what is going on. Okay, because okay? they can't when they're bending time, but they Mary, can once. They soft disclosure thing going on by the U.S. government. What do you feel about that? I think it's orchestrated, very orchestrated. Um, yeah, and you know, Dr. Carol, Carol Rosen, who is a good friend has said all along that Vaughan Brown Brown always said they would use that as the final thing to fear, fear the ETs, a false flag of alien invasion. I believe, and Dr. Stephen Greer also mentions that as well. There's many others. The truth is that we have artificial um, uh, craft that have been designed by our, uh, by our military that emulate the um, spacecraft as well. And they're used in covert, in covert um, shape programs or, as well. Yeah. So people could be seeing, um, I don't know, a triangular craft that actually isn't ET, that is one of ours. So this is the mix that most of the public don't realize. And my understanding is that the governments have been told, you know, that you've got to start coming out and telling the truth to the people or we will do it. But they're trying to control the narrative. They're trying to control it in a way that gets people very, very scared so that they will trust the government. Well, the understanding is that many of these, these um, beings come from various star systems, other dimensions and what have you. Now, the people that are having experiences with them or um, having downloads from them and what have you, many of them are now being told this information that the governments are basically going to have to get the finger out and start saying stuff. So you're getting soft disclosure, but it's with a narrative that suits the governments because ultimately they don't want us to trust what we're seeing. Yeah. And if we do see it, it could very well not be them. It could be um, it could be the military and what have you creating the whole fear story. Now, I can uh, see I've heard... I've heard a, a, a like a, a PSYOP on a PSYOP, we'll call it, that Project Bluebeam... Yes is just a diversion that it's not really going to happen but it's for us to it's for us to believe that the government is actually going to do project blue beam when in fact it's actual aliens that are coming you know like generous and you know yeah. these loving aliens and we're not going to believe her like no that's just the government you know i've heard this as a theory as well there are certain things that people will know with that make it a false flag and that's because mm -hmm. the Real ET technology is seamless in, in many ways when you look at it. There's not, we haven't quite managed a lot of that with the these reconstructed ones um, that they, they put out there. And I think the other thing is that those that have had experiences with many of these intelligences that they feel connected to, you know, like people say, well, I feel I'm part Pleiadian or part Octorian. It's part of their DNA that's been activated that relates to that particular um, DNA that they've been given. So if somebody says, I just feel I'm from somewhere else. I don't belong here. Um, often that's what's being yeah. activated. I've said that like, whenever I look up at the stars, I feel like that's home. Like, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I love living on earth, but when I look up at the stars, that's home. And, and yeah. I think dreams are one of our most powerful tools. And mm. that night that I, I did that, I was like, okay, when I go to sleep, I want to know why that is. And I was given a movie. I was like, uh, like, and when you're talking about dreams that people remember, like I do have abduction. I do have alien operation dreams, nothing painful. Um, but like, like where they replace something up here, they replace two, yes. two parts of my brain up here. Um, and I, yes. and I remember that to this day, that was probably like eight years ago. This other dream was around eight years ago as well. And I was told that I was from another star system. Um, I came I came here in the belly of my mother. I was a, a fetus at the time, and but it was it, it was an amazing story. I'll, I'll have to share that one of these times on one of our podcasts. But it's it's a full length movie. I I, I started writing a book about it, but that I got sidetracked. <laughs>
Well, that's what I would say, Rai, about this sensing, knowing feeling. That doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from your multidimensional self guiding you and giving you information because you, you may not be aware the science behind the fact that in our DNA, we access miniature wormholes that go into other areas of space and time. And what we're doing with our multidimensional self, that knowing, that sensing, that feeling is we're as we seek information, we're putting that frequency out and we're tapping into it through space time. And it gives us, you know, that buzz you get in your body, that yep. oh, that's yes. confirming it. That's showing you that you're tapping into that. I agree. Like, I think there's like this ether that we tap into for all these, like everything's already been created. We just haven't created it physically yet you know everything is there you know we can tap into this and you're saying opening these wormholes and bringing this information in uh like a prime example would be nikola uh nicholas tesla, tesla. Uh, nikola T nikolai yeah. tesla you know he talked about that he talked about being from venus um yes. you know he he had some amazing inventions and he would just I, he would just create these things it's just fantastic well, to give you an example of that, in my book, The New Human, where I talk about a lot of these children as well as the adults, one of the children that I spoke to was a nine-year-old at the time. He's not nine anymore. And I was speaking to his father and he said, can I speak to Mary? And I said, you know, why do you want to speak to me? He says, because of your frequency. And then he explained to me that he was from Orion. He had been a light physicist working with time travel technology. And he said he's um, and he's come on to this planet and he said the nearest to his understanding is Nikola Tesla's work because all the other scientists basically haven't got a clue. Um, <laughs> this is a really? nine year old explaining to me. And also wow. what was interesting is that he told me also that he would go to other sacred sites. And when he goes to the sacred sites, he gets he gets downloads of information. It's like it acts as a conduit to give him more information. And that's why he was going to a lot of the sacred sites. And this is this is a nine year old explaining this to me. So uh, to go back to the soft disclosure for a second, I have a question. Yeah. Mary, what's your opinion on why now? Why now? Is something going to happen? Is there some type of event yeah. going to happen in which something is revealed? And that's why they're, they're telling or we're raising, yeah, the or consciousness, raising our consciousness or... or what is going on? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What has been very clear with the, you know, the hundreds that I've spoken to is that they are aware something is ahead, something hugely significant to the, the, the planet, a kind of awakening, um, an activation of consciousness. And they are aware that it's going to be literally planetary wide and that it will change everything that we know. And some are calling it an event. Some have talk about going to another frequency you know, the fifth density and what have you. There's a whole right. range of them. And, and what is going with that is this activation of what I think is the dormant DNA. Because many of those that are connecting, it's all to do with the activation of dormant DNA, which is our heritage. So this is what, what's going on right now. And that's why so many people are waking up and so many people are changing the way they look at things changing the way that they operate and what have you. And this is, you know, and this is leading us, I think, to some kind of major event of consciousness. And this is why so many people feel anxiety. They may feel trepidation. They may, may feel excitement. They may feel a whole range of things because part of them knows this is what's ahead. This isn't just imagination. This is what they're feeling. And everything oh. that's chaos on this world at the moment is part of that. Do you, this is Mary, why. Do you think, Mary, do you think that everybody is waking up? Or do you think there's some people who won't be coming along with us on this on this awakening? I've got two mixed kind of uh, information on that. There is a 12 year old that explains that everyone ultimately will reach that level. Um, she's saying it's going through the solar system, that it's happening everywhere. And it's also happening to the animals. Everything is being upgraded. And others say there are some that are going to choose to stay in this reality and will obviously choose another time. So yeah, I don't like, know. Like, like, like a split almost. It's, it's like almost like yeah. there's going to be a split. Um, I, yeah. I, I was and thinking that there would be like a split of 
like a world on top of a world almost like we don't mm. we'll we'll move away but we'll still be there but uh, it, it, that's how i feel i feel like it's yeah some are saying that the new earth is already there waiting for us to join it like it's in a different frequency exactly so as we that's raise our frequency exactly we then move into the new frequency it may be that or it may be more than that because the other thing that I know about that looks very credible is about the space arcs, which you may or may not know about. And that's a, I've just done a presentation for um, Prague, the SUNY University on this particular presentation. And it's about a past life connection to what may happen and may be happening here. And to cut a long story short, the lady that I talked about that her friends were on the craft with her and this gentleman, wanted to know why there was a there was a message that she didn't understand or didn't remember. So I did a regression with her and she went back to the time of Atlantis where she was there wow. with these friends and they were hoping to make the change then. It didn't work, that there was um, it was compromised. So they've come this time to because that's the mission this time is to help with the shift and the change on this planet. And what was fascinating to me was that she was seeing what looked like craft, like space arcs, like craft under, not only underground, but some underwater, one particularly around the Bermuda Triangle. And she was seeing that there. Within a week, I was looking at Dr. Michael Sala's work with JP, a whistleblower, who was talking about the military knowing there are these arcs underground where there are huge beings, avatars in stasis, including beings, and these were being activated by consciousness right now. And look, there's a lot more to it, but it's not just in the Bermuda Triangle. When she became part of a remote viewing group, they, they also saw others around the planet including one in Romania. And if you know about what's going on in Romania, in a, it's um, Transylvanian Sunrise writes about, they found in 2003, I think it was, a cavern by the Sphinx in Romania. And underneath is this huge cavern that only let you in if you had the right consciousness. And it had all this technology that came from the ancient uh, gods, if you like, or beings that show our true history but underneath that re um, remote viewed is actually a pyramid and an arc, another of these craft. Holy cow. Activated. And to add to that is the understanding. There's one, there's one, there's, they're all over the world. There's two in Brazil. There's one in Australia. There's one in Iraq, Egypt, and they're all being activated across the planet. <clears throat> Why do you think this information so, is being suppressed and by who and for what purpose? There are, the thing is, the military, obviously, the covert military and what have you, and other groups that know about this technology. I mean, there's so much technology we're not given access to that they have. Um, some say 30 years in advance of what we've got. Some say 50 years in advance. Everything from healing technology to free energy to whatever. Dr. Greer talks about it and others talk about it. You know, the whistleblowers talk about this as well. What they're trying to do is keep the lid on it because they don't want the public to know what's going on. Because once the public realizes that we've been polluting our planet when we didn't need to for a start, because there is technology for free energy for everyone, that was being known about now for many, many years. That's just one thing, healing technology, um, a whole range of technologies that would change our planet forever that should have been given to us. What do you think they're going to do to the people that have hidden this from us? What do you think is going to happen to them if the public awesome. find out? See, so they've got, they are really, there's going to have to be some kind of deal done. There's certainly a suggestion that there are certain groups of non-human intelligences that have um, a, a agendas on this planet and are working through d various people. And I can't dismiss any of that because we do know that certain entities that are self-serving, whether or not they're extraterrestrial or interdimensional or whatever, have also had access to controlling the narrative as well.
So that it's, again, it's not black and white. The majority of what I understand about these ETs is the majority seem to be absolutely benevolent that are wanting to see us join them, um, you know, to the galactic community and are creating the, um, the, the space and the um, support to enable us to be part of their galactic community. And when I say that, a lot of the children are in co communication telepathically. There are lots of people having experiences that are in communication telepathically with various ET, um, both physical and non-physical, whether it's Pleiadians, um, whether or not it's Arcturus, Andromeda, um, there are interdimensional ones as well that are, um, have come in. I remember the 10 year old telling me that he came through a portal in the sun. So he came from another dimension. There are many that have come from other dimensions to join in on this awakening of humanity that have incarnated wow. to humans so that they can be part of this shift in consciousness that is so going to be so important and so dramatic for humanity. And it's all about that really is, is upgrading us to the point where we can interact intergalactically and, um, with all these different intelligences. Mary, when you're talking about these, uh, these arcs and you mentioned Iraq now, I know we're talking about the military before as well. Do you believe that maybe that was one of the reasons why Iraq was, we'll say wrongfully <laughs> invaded the second time, you know, when they're wrongfully invaded, was that to get tech or, you know, to spy? Yes. And I, I can more or less I get away with saying it now. I couldn't in 2003 because right. I was told by an intuitive that the reason they had gone into Iraq wasn't anything to do with weapons of mass destruction. They knew that Saddam Hussein had access to ancient technologies, etc. And they were worried about that and wanted it. If you know, the Baghdad Museum was ransacked. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Um, and when I learned this, I found, well, I thought it was a bit bizarre. So I talked to somebody in intelligence. I, I can't say who they were, but they told me not to speak about it, not to talk about it, not to write about it, not to phone anyone about it. Basically, not to say anything, which told me everything I needed to know exactly. that this was. Okay. Um, and now with the arcs, and understanding, do you realize that in Ukraine, there are supposedly two arcs there in Ukraine? Putin has one in Russia. Okay, just to add flavor to the possibilities, okay. you can think about that one. So there may be more to the Ukrainian war uh, with Russia than we um, are told, but we already know that anyway. Um, but the, this is the U, U.S. military do know about the arcs. But the interesting thing is you can't get into the arcs unless you've got a certain consciousness. And this is what the whistleblower JP was saying when Dr. Michael Sala in, interviewed him. But there are arcs elsewhere. And there are also these beings in stasis, these huge beings in stasis that appear to be waiting for something, whether they're going to be activated or what we don't know. So this is all possibly part of an event that is nothing to do with the military whatsoever. And the, what was fascinating to me is I'm doing this regression, finding out a link from a past life to do with Atlantis. And we, we know that there is suggestions that Atlantis is around that um, area with the Bermuda Triangle and what have you as well. Um, and the, the fact that I found out later how it linked into that regression that I did within a week, you know, we talked about things being put into place and how you're led into information as it's time. Yes. Well, I suspect that that was why that came up because it convinced me there was more to this when you've got all these, you know, this extra validation um, coming from other sources that say the same thing and you have to say, okay, there's something here. Is there a, Mary, we're talking about this inevitability of, an, of a consciousness expansion or a change in frequencies. What can the average person, I don't know if that's the correct terminology, do to further this along so we can get to... So we can get into the, the next. <laughs> I want to get to the new earth. I want to get to the new technology and love and peace. Uh, how do we get there? 
Well, I think that as you know, we're waking up, we are guided by another part of ourselves. You know, you call it your super conscious, your higher self, over soul, whatever it is. We're guided because we change. We find ourselves feeling all those kinds of things about, you know, goodwill to each other, trying to be different, changing the way we do things. And I think each soul is leading that person. You know, I, I've always said that, you know, we, we um, present ourselves with all the, all the tools we need for our particular life. Everything is there. The trouble is that we're told right from the beginning that you're, you're this, you're no good, you're a sinner. Well, in Catholic Church, you're a sinner from the word go, aren't you? Because yep, dear old exactly. Eve et Zappel, which I thought was most unfair. Um, but all these things we're told we're not good enough, we need pieces of paper to prove we're good enough, we have to do this to be good enough and whatever. Ultimately, our soul is guiding the journey. And I always say your soul isn't going to let you miss the bus because work too darn hard to get you here. If you trust that and that, what's inside you, not what other people are telling you, this is about you honoring you and your own knowing, your own sensing, your own feeling. This isn't about, you know, all these other gurus telling you what to do. This is about you resonating to your own truth. That's all we've got at the end of the day is that. That's wow. the only thing we've got that can guide us. I have so many more questions. I know no. we, we're, we're just touching on so many topics. And, um, and you were talking about, is there anywhere you can, whoops, uh, and we have some fireworks going off here, here in Mexico. So... Uh, is there any way you could expand more on Atlantis? You know, any more information that you've uh, uh, you've heard or listened to from some of these regressions uh, from some of you, uh, some of the people that you've studied with or studied? There's been a number that have gone back to the time of Atlantis. Mm -hmm. um, the lady that I mentioned that's in that presentation that I I've sent to. Um, Prague was about her own experiences being a light worker in Atlantis and that they, they failed and that there was a destruction going on because they were not doing things with integrity and using uh, technology with integrity. But I also add in there an interview that I did some years ago with a, another young lady called Leah Capitali and she remembers her time in Atlantis and she literally describes the moment when she's downloading information and this is <laughs> this is going to perhaps surprise some of your listeners she was one of those that she was a researcher that downloaded information onto her crystal skull which is like a hard drive she said that it was um the skull acted like um literally a hard drive to contain information and she would download it to the crystal skull and she said afterwards i think my skull might have survived but she describes the moment when her parrot and the energy hits her and everything goes down and she knows that Atlantis is lost and she literally describes it in this um, clip that I've got but she also as I say describes that she was a researcher downloading information into a crystal skull. Um, there's another gentleman I remember doing a regression with him many years ago and he said it's the time of Atlantis and again this is going to stretch maybe some of your listeners but I said, so, you know, where were you or what were you doing in Atlantis? He said, well, actually, I was a dolphin. And they're very, very conscious and very yes. intelligent. And, and he was in the form of a dolphin at the time of Atlantis. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of stories now about either Lemuria or Atlantis as, as various people remember more about who they are and why they're, why they're here. And many of them have come back to finish what should have happened in terms of a consciousness awakening then. And what Leah was Ooh. saying and others are saying is that it was a very cosmopolitan um, intergalactic place. Atlantis had Arcturians there. That's why the Arcs are called Arcs from Arcturians because the Arcturians oh. apparently actually left this technology there. So it was literally intergalactic. There were all, all other different intelligences operating from Atlantis at the time. So there's, the, it just, you know, um, one of the interesting things, and I, I was talking to um, an Egyptologist uh, when I was at the Awakening Expo a few weeks ago, and he was saying how um, 
when he was showing people around various parts of um, Egypt, you know, the different ruins and what have you, he said he was a very traditional archaeologist, but he was showing them a certain area. And he said when he was showing them a certain area, he had some kind of shift in consciousness, some kind of frequency change. And he started to translate the hieroglyphs in a completely different way to the standard from that time and has come to understand a lot more. My, my sense is that it looks quite possible that the Atlanteans that survived went across the globe and were bringing their technology and their artifacts right across the globe. I don't know whether he uh, um, you know, thought that was relevant, but when we look at all these strange skulls all over the world that are not due to binding, there are some that were, but there are many skulls where the fetus was actually in the, in the uterus with the same, same shaped skull. So there's no doubt that they were some hybrid. And they said that already, you know, they've said that about Akhenaten. He had various anomalies in his DNA that showed that he was some form of hybrid. So we've got, we've got to look at archeology, span anthropology uh, as part of this and our um, way of interpreting what we're seeing, not from a conventional point of view, but expanding that option. When I was talking, um, there was a five-year-old that mentioned when his mum was telling him about the pyramids and he, he um, she was saying there was lots of slaves and this is what they did and what have you. And he said, no, mum. He said, you're wrong because I was there. They changed the density stru structure of objects, large and small, and they levitated them into place. This is a five-year-old explaining wow, what actually wow. happened because he was there. Wow. So... You know, you're getting information from sources that can't be disputed because where would a child of five come out right. with that kind of language? Let alone, I was there and this is how they did it <laughs> by levitation. <laughs> they so changed weird. the density structure of objects large and small and they levitated and, 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 them into place. And, and that really makes sense. It's almost like in, in buoyancy, when they talk about buoyancy, you know, they'd be, they almost made them buoyant to be able to move them. Yeah. That is fantastic. Yes. I think all investigation that departs from the standard um, program that we're, you know, he may be accurate in certain parts of it. He may or may not still be assuming certain things. One of the interesting things, books that I read many years ago was called Psychic Archaeology. And, it, uh, you know, I'm if it's weird, then I read it. You know, it's one of those <laughs> things. I like your style. Um, I like your style. Look, if it's weird and wonderful, I've got a book on it, usually. Um, and this was many years ago. Um, I was reading about um, Glastonbury um, in this book, and it was about how they found the chapel and what have you. And it was found, actually, through psychic ar archaeology. There was someone who ch tuned in to where the church and the chapel was and all the uh, and actually was accurate. And that's where they knew how to dig. He was also someone, um, there were others that have gone to archaeological sites and, you know, the, the standard logical way we look at things and, you know, the academics or do left brain stuff. And they're able that many of these psychics are able to go to the timeline and actually describe what they're seeing, which is at the time that, that you're looking at this. So they're able to tap into that in a way that remote viewing does, because remote viewing can go through timelines. Well, this is what a psychic archaeology is. What we've got to start honoring is the fact that people can tune into the reality of that, that civilization, how they lived, to touch something. It's called psychometry. You can hold something and get information from it. You know, these are all ways we can get the truth of what it is rather than a hypothesis that may or may not be accurate or whatever. And this is my point, is that we, we're relying too much on left brain um, cognition, analysis, yes. and logic, when a lot of this we can tap into if we allow ourselves to get a, um, more accurate information about different ways people lived. And psychic archaeology in my book proved it because it was able to work out where certain things were, what they were for. There was one guy literally describing what they were doing with all the implements and how they used them because he was seeing it with this, you know, with that inner, inner vision. He was actually seeing yeah. how it all unloaded. And we can all do this. That's the point. It's not unique to certain people, but you've got to allow yourself to accept it.
And the problem is that we are programmed not to accept it because we're just imagining, aren't we? Or we're just weird or we're just crazy, which is, I think, a manipulation of human consciousness that's done deliberately to keep us in a box. One of the most powerful gifts that we have is imagination because people think imagination is just, oh, it's not. No, no, no. Imagination yeah. to me is creation. Yeah. The important thing to remember that people are inclined to disbelieve hypnosis is because they think someone's created that experience or what they're talking about. There's a very significant difference between hypnosis and subconscious information and your imagination. And to give you an example of that, when I work with someone in hypnosis, I make sure they understand the difference so that they don't dismiss information as it comes in. And one of the things is, for example, I'll say, in your reality, you know what your bedroom looks like. You know where the door is, where the bed is, where the windows are and what have you, because it's real and it's your bedroom. I said, if I asked you to imagine a bedroom, you'd have to think, well, how big would it be? Where would I put the window? Where would the door go? Where would I, what color would the, the curtains be or whatever? It's a different process. In hypnosis, when you take somebody into an experience, you're not saying create something. You're saying, what does it look like? Where are you going now? What's in front of you? It's completely different to imagination. Imagination, you have right. to create it first. In hypnosis, it's in front of you. Before you've even thought about it, it's there. And that's the difference. And when you take somebody into hypnosis, that's what you're doing. You're getting the subconscious to, you're saying to the subconscious, I want information on this. And the, the accuracy of hypnosis, as Dr. John Mack believes, was far more accurate than conscious memory. And why is that? Because in hypnosis, you don't edit out what you don't right. agree with or you think is too strange. In, no in conscious memory, yeah. you will you will filter it to make it reasonable, to make it um, acceptable. Whereas it isn't right. meant to be acceptable. When, you, when you're taping some reality, it isn't about whether or not you accept it or not. That's what you're seeing. And that's the difference between imagination. When something comes to you instantly, often without conscious thought, that's coming from that other part of you that's feeding you that information. And the trouble is that we, when we question or analyze, we get in the way. If we accept it as yes. it is, then you have the integrity of what that information is. And that's the difference between left brain and right brain. Interesting. I, I find this absolutely fascinating, uh, Mary. I have, I have one last question here. Um, now, you, you did remote viewing and, you know, people visiting um, uh, Atlantis. What about Antarctica? What about Antarctica? Anything? anything <laughs> well, I that... haven't had anyone. I've not had information on Antarctica other than Linda Morton Howe's put a lot of information out there. There's been others as well. The sense is that there's definitely likely an arc there as well. And I don't know whether you mentioned you were aware a few years ago where some very high profile people went to Antarctica. Um, yes. Very high profile. I think even one of the um, astronauts went there and was Buzz, blown away. Buzz I think they were. Buzz Aldrin went there. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. There, uh, there was a whole clique of elite people that went to see something in Antarctica and we were never told what it was that they saw, mm -hmm. but they were pretty blown mm -hmm. away. It was pretty obvious, something major they were shown. I suspect yep. it could very well have been one of these arcs. I don't know. I only can, you know, assume that something dramatic like that may very well have been there. They're all over the world and they're being activated by consciousness right now the the avatar you were saying like an avatar, avatar so like our our consciousness is would that be like our consciousness would be transferring into the avatar such as like how hollywood kind of gives us these disclosures you know like yeah. in truth in plain sight is that kind yeah. of same type of uh concept well let me explain something many years ago when i was talking to an eight-year-old who said that his family were the mantis beings and that when he dies he's going back to being a mantis um, so they're quite unusual looking beings, looking a bit like a praying mantis. And he told me that when he goes up on the spaceship, sometimes he evaporates into the mantis form. In other words, he, you know, he was describing his soul, leaving his human body and moving into the mantis form for a time. 
And I asked him, how did it feel? And he said it felt a bit strange, but he wasn't disturbed particularly by it. I have talked to others in hypnosis that have been on a craft where they've seen themselves in another body. Um, one lady was in a Zeta gray body. She said, I'm a scientist and I'm working on the, in this craft as a scientist. So I said, so where's your human body? And she said, well, it's sort of over there, sort of waiting, um, almost like it's sort of waiting on a hook there, waiting for her. And I said, so how do you get back to your human body? And she described this ball of light leaving the Zeta body, this blue, this ball of light traveling over to her human body and activating it. So when you see these balls of light in these um, lots of these different balls of light in films, digital films and what have you and, and videos and what have you, some of them, I believe, are souls. Um, because that's what we look like well, we look like a ball of light when we're not um, in our physical body. Wow. Because we are energy. You know, we're made up of energy. And, and that is like the energy leaving us. And it's yeah. balls of light, orbs of light are readily spotted, you mm -hmm. know, in conjunction with UFO, um, you know, spotting mm -hmm. of UFOs, mm -hmm. but also with cryptids yeah. like Bigfoot and, and other, uh, other things like that. Yes. There's always balls of light. Yeah. And... Some of them are small craft. Some of them are souls. Um, and what you're, when we're traveling out of body, that's that's what the, the Esa, you know the new age or esoteric metaphysical will call the Merkaba, your your energy body, your light body, and that's what we travel with when we go out of bodies in our light body. And that's why you're seeing, you know, many of these different balls of light coming and going through people and what have you is because that's what some of them are is is a soul or a spirit or somebody out of body wow that is amazing yeah we, we just we, we, so we, we want to say thank you so much, so much for giving us your time and and imparting so much of this information like i i feel that it's so much information you imparted that we need to unpack it but i feel like there's so much more you know i, I definitely would like you know maybe mm -hmm. In the future, we definitely would like to have you back, Mary, if that is possible. Of course. It's been a pleasure, guys. I look forward to our next adventure together as we navigate the mysteries that lie ahead. Until our paths cross again, keep your curiosity wandering and ensure the light remains lit.